Yes, please. Hossein, please start. Okay, hello everybody. Uh, we are today so glad to uh, for uh, to be uh, with a, a big professors and big names in the field of refractive surgery and coronary diagnosis and management. And we are still c confused about this issue, uh, despite of the all advances and the all diagnostics up till now. Ictesia is still the refractive nightmare, as the title of Professor Magdi. Presentation, and despite we have a lot of patients with normal topography, tomography, and even by biomechanical properties, but these patients are still not 100% protected from ectasia. But nowadays we we are gonna know uh, a, a lot of about the new advances and the new diagnostics and for the enhanced ectasia screening from our professors. And let me to say welcome for uh, the, one of the, one of the uh, most expert uh, researcher in the field of uh, ectasia screening, Professor Renato Ambrosio from Brazil. You are, we are so glad to be with us today. And let me to, uh, to introduce my professor, Professor Magdi Khalaf, Professor of Ophthalmology at Azhar University, and one of the eminent surgeons, a refractive surgeon, and one of my professors, who I got a lot of learnings from, from him. Also, we are honored uh, to be, uh, to have our chairman, Dr. Mahmoud Ismail, one of the international corneal and refractive surgeon, and who is the, the first one took my hand <coughs> in surgery, and I got a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, tics, tips and tricks from him all the time and up till now. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank you for all. And, uh, I, 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 I will ask now my professor, Dr. Mehdi Khalaf, to start his presentation. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Hussein, for this introduction. And I would like also to thank Professor Ismail for inviting me to share in this uh, prestigious uh, event. Uh, I'd like also to uh, welcome our guest speaker, uh, Professor Renato Ambrosio from Brazil. Of course, uh, Brazil is well known for uh, the uh, good uh, football player. Uh, also, he's a good player, but in, uh, not in football, in, in something else. Uh, all of us, we know his achievement in the field of uh, refractive surgery. So welcome, uh, Dr. Renato. Of course, the topic today uh, is one of the nightmares. The uh, corneal ectasia, as we all know, is one of the most devastating complications after laser vision correction. Uh, as we all know, the first case was reported by Fusilier in 1998. And before this date, people were not minded with this type of complications. And you see, they were not keen to study well the topography, pachymetry, and everything. Because uh, before the case of Zeiler, sometimes you hear uh, one of the refractive surgeons proud that he uh, corrected uh, minus 15 or minus 17 for uh, a patient. But after the, uh, this uh, case was reported, uh, uh, the refractive surgery started another uh, era. Uh, the patient with corneal ectasia will come to your office uh, complaining of diminution of vision in one or uh, both eyes, mostly in one eye first. And you will examine, you will find that he, is, he has some uh, degree of myopia, myopic astigmatism, uh, loss of uncorrected vision, sometimes loss of miscorrected vision. Uh, with or without central and paracentral thinning and topographic evidence of asymmetric inferior steepening. This is one of the nightmare. This is a patient with uh, post lasik ectasia. He has inferior steepening. He has front elevation and back elevation, and there is corneal thinning. You see the thinnest location is 350, and the Amex is 50 plus. This is another case of the nightmares. This is more advanced in ectasia than the previous case. Uh, the, you see the cornea here is hyperprolate. If you look here, you will find that the K reading is minus 1.6 and the K max is 60, uh, 66. The, there is anterior elevation, there is back elevation, there is corneal thinning, the thinnest location 
360. And also, if you look at the cornea of the corneal back, you will find that the K mean at the back is minus 9.2, which is far from the normal. This is another entity of uh, ectasia. This is the post smile, not post lasik. This is post smile ectasia. Although at the early days of a smile, some refractive surgeons claim that smile will not affect the corneal biomechanics. However, we started to record some cases of post smile ectasia. And as you all know, the first case was reported by our colleague from Egypt, Professor Tari El Najjar. This topography after uh, implanting an intraocular uh, ring, uh, intracornea ring, just to help to uh, correct the condition. The uh, exact incidence of uh, post lasik ectasia is unknown. Uh, on one hand, because not all the cases are reported, uh, this is um, you see there are some reports of 0.04 incidents, some reports of 0.2, some reports of 0.6. However, there is an interesting, uh, an interesting. Hatem, Hatem, Okay. However, there is an interesting survey done among the members of ISRS and the American Academy of Ophthalmology in year 2004, and they found that uh, more than 50% of refractive surgeons had at least one case of post lasik ectasia in their practice. The reported average onset is 15 months, with more than 50% presenting with the, within the uh, first, uh, first year. Ectasia can develop after LASIK, after SMILE, and even after uh, surface ablation. But the vast majority of cases uh, reported after LASIK, maybe this is because LASIK has the uh, uh, most refractive corneal surger surgeries uh, utilize the LASIK uh, uh, technology, uh, and also the most important is the corneal biomechanics. If we talk about the corneal biomechanics, of course, of course, we expect that all the uh, corneal refractive surgeries will affect the uh, corneal biomechanics, but to different extent. So. LASIK will be the uh, most procedure to affect the biomechanics more than a smile and uh, more than uh, so the least to affect the biomechanics, of course, is surface ablation. And this is, I think this is logic because if you correct, say, you will correct a, a minus five a diopter, you will ablate for around 60 to 70 uh, microns. So for surface ablation, you are ablating the 60 or 70 micron. For, this, for the uh, uh, LASIK, you will ablate the same amount uh, plus the uh, creation of the uh, uh, corneal flap. So uh, there is much more affection for the biomechanics because the tissue altered in uh, surface ablation is much less, uh, much less than the tissue altered in, uh, in LASIK. What are the risk factors? Of course, the first, the first thing to talk about is uh, topography. Abnormal topography seems to be the most important identifiable risk factor. So please, for any patient who will, who will you will admit refractive surgery, you have to study carefully your, uh, the patient uh, topography. Uh, there is a, this is an axial map of a patient with inferior steepening. The, uh, the uh, carrying in the inferior part is 49.5, and the superior part is 47.1, so there is a difference of 2.4. The acceptable difference is uh, uh, around 1.5. If more than this, you have to check, check carefully your uh, map. Of course, we are not going to give our decision depending on a single uh, on a single map, uh, you will collect all your data starting from the patient age, patient gender, the refractive error, the uh, axial map, the uh, uh, front 
uh, and back elevation and of course the, the uh, bachymetry. So, uh, but for a case like that, you have to be careful. This may be a form frost keratoconus. Another case of inferior stiffening here also, there is difference between the inferior and the superior part. And there is, there is a uh, what we call the tongue shape extension. And this cornea is thin, the thickness is 470. So be careful with a case like that. Apart from inferior steepening, we have also the superior steepening. The superior steepening, uh, uh, the acceptable difference between the superior and the inferior part must not exceed 2.5. If more than that, you have to uh, check carefully your patient because this may be what we call uh, uh, superior keratoconus or uh, uh, what we call uh, reverse keratoconus, inverted keratoconus. But uh, be careful, we have in uh, our community in Egypt, we have a very common disease which is trachoma, which will cause a trachomatous panas at the superior part of the cornea. So uh, check carefully your patient on this lit lamp. If he has this panas, this may explain uh, this superior steepening. If not, if not, uh, uh, so uh, check everything carefully. This is the superior steepening, but this is acceptable difference. The difference between the superior and the inferior is only 1.4, so this is within normal. Uh, this is an important issue also, the skewing of the axis. If you uh, see uh, the uh, the uh, inferior uh, part of the voti. If you extend like that, you will uh, you will find an axis between uh, these two. So there is if the skewing is more than 22 22 degrees. So uh, this is abnormal. Uh, at the same time, this cornea is 460. So uh, check carefully. Uh, the skewing is very important part to uh, check. Be careful with uh, corneas with against the rule astigmatism. You see here the steep meridian is horizontal, so this is against the rule astigmatism. And you, if you see here the K max is 49.5, so this is abnormal. The thinnest location is deviated a little bit uh, downwards, it's more than 0.5, which is abnormal. And the difference between the thinnest location and the pachymetry apex is more than 10, so uh, this is abnormal. So be careful with corneas uh, with the, against the rule uh, astigmatism. Another case with uh, something abnormal here, you will find that the KMAX is 49.1, although the cornea uh, has a very good thickness, it's five, uh, uh, 578, but still uh, there is some abnormality, the KMAX is, is high, and also, if you look at the back, uh, the K2 is 4.7 and the K1 is 7. So this is uh, uh, away from normal. So uh, please check carefully. You can check your uh, Bellin Ambrosio of the patient. You will find here abnormality uh, at the back. And you see these boxes are, uh, the red boxes here are uh, uh, abnormal. Another case with, uh, Anti, uh, uh, abnormality in the uh, front elevation. Another case with ab uh, abnormality in the front and in the back. I noticed that some of our uh, junior uh, uh, colleague doesn't pay a, a good attention to, the, uh, to this uh, uh, part of the uh, examination. But please uh, look carefully at the Bellin Ambrosio, look, look carefully at the, these progression curves you see the average of the uh, progression index must not exceed 1.1 here. It's 1.29. And these boxes are very important. And I noticed that most of our junior colleagues doesn't give good attention to this, uh, to this part of the examination. Uh, these boxes must appear, in, uh, must appear white like this, but if it appears yellow or red, so there is uh, something abnormal. The first box will give you the deviation of the front, the next one deviation of the back, deviation of the progression, deviation of the th thickness, and the last one will give you the average, the average of the deviation. This, uh, the last D, the average, this one, 
<clears throat> must not exceed 1.5. But if it's more than this, you have to check uh, your patient carefully. Some, uh, another point, uh, be careful. If your patient is myopic, you have to press here. If your patient is hypropic or has mixed cylinder, you have, uh, you have to uh, press here. Otherwise, you will uh, uh, get a, a wrong interpretation. Another case with uh, anterior and uh, back elevation, you know, you see these, uh, the boxes are in red and yellow. Uh, this is also with uh, a problem in the uh, front, uh, front and here, uh, front and back. If you have uh, this tongue shape extension, uh, this tongue shape uh, in, at the back with the best fit sphere or this isolated uh, island, you have to check carefully all your uh, Pacumet, uh, you, uh, all your uh, pentacam uh, results. So we finish with the first risk factor, which is the most important, which is the uh, which is the topography. And now uh, we go to another very important risk factor, which is uh, the pachymetry. What is the problem with pachymetry? The pachymetry is important because you have to leave enough residual stromal depth. But the question is, what is this enough residual stromal bed? Uh, tradition, uh, uh, first, first, when uh, Theo Zeiler discovered his, uh, reported his case of uh, ectasia, he suggested that the uh, enough residual stromal bed will be 250, uh, but nowadays it's uh, suggested to be uh, 300. But is it a magic number? Is it if is you you are safe hundred percent if you left three hundred micron? I think the answer is no because sometimes you are leaving three hundred twenty and still the patient develop ectasia and sometimes you will leave two hundred twenty and still the cornea is doing fine. So there is no magic number, uh, but now we are talking about the percentage of tissue altered. By the percentage of tissue altered, we mean, we mean the tissue which is altered by your uh, procedure. This is the, uh, in case of LASIK, this is the flap plus the ablation depth. So the flap plus the ablation depth must be divided uh, uh, by the corneal thickness and the, uh, uh, this PTA percent must, must not exceed 35% if it's more than 40, so the patient is at increased risk of developing ectasia. Uh, and I think this is more logic than the, uh, the fixed number of 300 or uh, 250 because this individualizes the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, percentage uh, and you uh, are now you are uh, calculating the flap plus the ablation depth and considering the corneal thickness and considering the uh, residual but this PTA we are calculating this PTA for normal eyes normal corneas normal topography but don't calculate if you have abnormality in your topography don't calculate the PTA and say it's only 30%, we can go. No, this is just for the normal eyes. But also for the normal eyes, if you exceed it for 40%, you have, the, your patient is at increased risk of developing ectasia. So try to uh, please to respect this uh, PTA in uh, normal eyes. What about thin corneas? Thin corneas are not a contraindication uh, for refractive surgery, but you have to check your topography carefully. Uh, if it's normal thin cornea, it's okay. You go uh, uh, for the procedure, but you calculate the PTA. But I think for corneas with uh, thickness less than 480, uh, there is increased risk of developing ectasia. The other important risk factor is age. Because a patient of 18 years is not like a patient of uh, 35 years. So uh, uh, the age is another risk factor. And be careful with patient who is young and with questionable topography. 
and we needs, who needs a large correction because this group of patients shown to have a higher incidence of, uh, incidence of ectidia. So uh, if you have question of th uh, topography in young patient and we need a uh, uh, large correction, please uh, uh, be careful with these uh, type of patients. What about refraction? Of course, refraction, the higher refraction, the higher the risk of uh, ectasia because uh, if you are, uh, ab say, if you are uh, ablating a patient for uh, minus one, is not like minus eight, is not my, uh, like minus uh, 12, the more uh, the correction, the more the uh, tissue will be removed from uh, the cornea, the more the affection of the corneal biomechanics, uh, the more the incidence of, uh, of ectasia. Enhancement. Be careful with patient uh, uh, with enhancement because a good number of these patients will develop ectasia. Why? Because sometimes the patient is coming to your office asking for uh, enhancement and you check the patient, you find he has some degree of myopia or myopic astigmatism and you rush uh, for uh, enhancement. And this was not a regression. This was a starting, a starting ectasia. So uh, be careful, you have to, don't rush uh, for enhancement. Check your patient carefully because remember, this may not be a, a regression. This may not starting ectasia and your enhancement will trigger uh, or aggravate the uh, problem. Asymmetry, uh, be cautious with, this is another red flag. Be cautious with patient who has astigmatism with the rule in one eye and astigmatism uh, again is the rule in the other eye because one of these eyes uh, may be progressing toward uh, cret corners or PMD. The other important risk factors like family history. I usually respect family history. I remember the long time ago, a patient came to my office asking for uh, lazy while I am checking her topography. It was questionable topography. I was still looking at the uh, axial map, at the front and back elevation and the progression and everything. I was hesitated to do or not to do. And then suddenly the patient told me, doctor, I'm a sister of one of your patients in whom you implanted the intracorneal ring last year. So she gave me the clue. I abandoned the procedure and then after around maybe after one year, she started to develop frank keratoconus in one of the eyes and we uh, uh, did uh, cross-linking and then she is in the follow-up now. Gender is very important. As we all know, uh, females are more prone to ectasia than males because of the hormonal, uh, hormonal factors, uh, especially during pregnancy and uh, lactation. Uh, eye rubbing is very important. I'm a strong believer that eye rubbing can aggravate uh, the uh, keratoconus or uh, keratectasia. Uh, there are many uh, ectasia scoring system. The most common of them is the one suggested by Randleman, and there is another one by Tabara, and there is another uh, huge work done by one of our colleagues, Dr. Muhammad Iqbal from Suhaq. Uh, university. Uh, for Randleman, he uh, considered topography, residual stromal bed, uh, age, uh, corneal thickness, and spherical equivalent, and he gave number for every, uh, every item, and then uh, he uh, 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 calculate the risk if the patient has uh, from zero to two uh, score, uh, he, the risk is low, you can proceed. But if he has three, there is moderate risk. You have to be cautious. If more than four, there is high risk. Uh, and don't do LASIK. Anyhow, th these are, um, uh, there are many uh, scoring systems. But I'm, I'm actually, I don't obey uh, all these uh, scoring systems. I'm just uh, checking my patient carefully with the topography, pachymetry, and everything. And we consider uh, the uh, age, the uh, Oh, uh, and sometimes we revert to uh, corneal biomechanics. Uh, this is also suggested by uh, Dr. Sinjab. Uh, 
how to prevent uh, ectasia. Uh, uh, to prevent ectasia, you check your patient carefully with all the available technologies. We have uh, many weapons uh, to, uh, to uh, defend against uh, this uh, complication. So check carefully your topography, your tomography, your biomechanics, uh, ORA or porous, and we have now the epithelial mapping uh, OCT also. Uh, to prevent, please, uh, you can, uh, you can uh, choose uh, another procedure other than LASIK. You can go for surface ablation, and, and we, as we mentioned before, it has a uh, low incidence of uh, ectasia, and I think the number of cases reported, the number of cases reported after PRK are very minimal uh, during the whole history of refractive surgery, maybe uh, 40 cases or something like that. Besides, it's, uh, you are not ablating uh, or you are not altering much tissue. I, I think that PRK, the ablation of the epithelial basement membrane together with the uh, Bowman's membrane, together with the superficial stroma, I think the ablation of this complex may have an inflammatory reaction which causes like um, minimal scarring, minimal haziness, which has maybe may have uh, some cross-linking effect. We have another option, which is the FICIC IOL, uh, like the ICL, and I like these uh, options. So, but if already you have a patient with, uh, with ectasia, you can, uh, you have uh, different uh, weapons, different technologies, you can start cross-linking, you can do uh, ICR, like a case like that. Uh, this is another case we, we have done ICR. Uh, you see here the uh, K-mean was 47.6. After the ICR, it's a 43.9. Uh, but uh, remember, the implantation of ICR in a patient with ectasia is uh, not like the patient of keratoconus. The patient of keratoconus is much more uh, easier to implant intracorneal ring because uh, the patient with keratoconus, you have the whole thickness of the cornea you can play. Say you have 450 in a patient with keratoconus, you, have, you can play uh, through the whole thickness. But a patient with ectasia, if he has 450, still you have to uh, consider the thickness of the flap, which may be 110, 120. So the uh, available thickness which you are uh, playing with is much less than uh, the one with keratoconus. Uh, um, sometimes you, you may uh, need to uh, do dial. Uh, so in conclusion, ectasia is a rare but potentially devastating complication. Ectasia occur more frequently after uh, LASIK, uh, of course more than uh, uh, surface ablation because of the biomechanical uh, issue. Uh, many risk factors have been identified like uh, abnormal uh, topography, uh, thin uh, pachymetry, uh, young age, uh, uh, patient with uh, asymmetry, uh, uh, family history, and so on. Uh, when ectasia does occur, you can go for cross-linking, ICR, DAL, and rarely uh, you will uh, require to do uh, PKB. Uh, and thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, uh, sir, for this uh, rich presentation and stepping one. And it's, it's so simple and detailed one about the, the, the points to be checked on, on the careful checking of the patient, uh, aiming at the prevention of ectasia. And, and we are hoping to be uh, away all the time from the, from this uh, nightmare. Thank you, Dr. Magdi. And uh, I will ask my, I may ask my uh, co dear colleagues who sent, who sent a lot of questions to postpone the discussion and questions after the presentation of Professor Renato Ambrosio to be continuous. And I think a lot of questions which I, uh, which I had may be answered by the coming presentation by Dr. Ambrosio and then we will discuss all of it at the end together. Thank you. So I may ask my dear friend, uh, Professor Renato Ambrosio, 
a professor of ophthalmology the Federal University, Rio de Janeiro, uh, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, to start uh, his uh, interesting presentation. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, I hear yeah. you well. Yeah. Excellent. So uh, this was a very good talk. Actually, this made a very good overview about uh, ectasia, understanding the risk, the literature is very, very well covered. But I think I have some personal insights that may add which, uh, to this great talk that we have just listened, which I highly agree with all the, all the concepts. But the main point is to go beyond. So remember this sentence, enhanced ectasia assessment means going beyond, going beyond the understanding of everything, of what is abnormal corneal, and it's not only shape, it's a structure before surgery, understanding the impact from surgery, understanding the role of the ectasia risk assessment in terms of how good can you be? And of course, expanding it to the main important thing, which in, I believe in the ectasia risk is eye rubbing. So um, my financial disclosure, this is a little bit. Yeah, you, you left can you see? No, no, uh, share your screen again. So this is my financial disclosure. The group of colleagues that collaborate with me, I always have to recognize because we don't do anything by ourselves. When we talk about Ectasia, we have to refer to Professor Seiler in 1998, and it was very nicely done and very elegant presentation. But I'd like to remember that he published two papers. The first paper was on atrogenic Ectasia after patients with high myopia. This patients with high, do you, do you see my mouse here? Yes. Or yeah. do you see? Yeah. Yeah, okay. And, and the second case was uh, uh, on, on, on a patient that was considered as form fus keratoconus. And this patient with form fus, fus keratoconus was um, really something to be understood because he considered form fus keratoconus based on, on um, what he said to be abnormal topography. So we can also have ectase after smile and uh, Al Magar from Egypt did the very nice uh, report on this. And when I read this paper, I immediately called him and I was very glad to collaborate with him because he sent me the raw data of the pre-op of this patient. So long story short, this patient was said not to do refractive surgery, but he did smile considering the biomechanical advantage, which indeed I do believe there is a biomechanical advantage in smile, but the patient has keratoconus before surgery. And we were able to look at the pre-op topography. And here we have three different scales. The, the, the scale, uh, if you change the intervals, you see much more abnormality. Objectively, this patient had abnormal TKC, which is a topometric keratoconus classification based on front surface curvature. This is Pentacam data. And if you look at the indices, many of the indices are abnormal in both eyes. So this patient had keratoconus before surgery. So the first thing to avoid ectasia to progress after laser vision correction is of course, to identify the patients with ectasia before surgery. Because if the patient has ectasia before surgery, the surgery will weaken the cornea and make the cornea more unstable and to progress with worse ectasia. So we have to understand that preoperative screening is critical and it's very important to understand what is early keratoconus. And topography has done a very good work to improve our ability to detect mild subclinical disease. Of course, the impact from surgery is important. We evolved from 250 to 300, and then to half of the cornea. This was published in 2001, and here we, we talk about half of the cornea to be preserved. My colleague Marconi Santiago, he proposes that we have to, to, to save 
60% of the cornea, more than half of the cornea. But I would say that even with 60% save of residual stromal bed, which means less than 40% of percent tissue altered, you still can have ectasia as I will demonstrate to you in this uh, series that we have. Uh, my colleague Brad Runneman did a very nice work in the early year 2000s and he published this ectasia risk score system which was very nicely approached in the previous talk as well. My main criticism is that we never, first we never got to be more than 95% uh, uh, sensitive with this. So it's 91 sensitivity, 94% sensitivity in the original series and then in the validation series that were published in the ophthalmology journal and then the American Journal of Ophthalmology. So the Blue Journal and the AJO in 2008 uh, published the cases and the sensitivity was never more than 95%. Also, he put foam through keratoconus as a topometric, as a topography criteria. And I do believe this is a misconception. That's exactly the point that we have to evolve. Interestingly, he pointed age. Age is a surrogate of biomechanical properties. So if the patient is younger than certain age, you will be likely to have more chances of ectasia because the cornea did not have the, the, the time for the natural cross-linking. Interestingly, we know that the patient gets a strong cornea when he, the patient gets older, but I don't think it's a, make, it's a good sense from one birthday to the other, from 25 to 26, that he decreases so much in terms of risk factor. So I think it's much more like a continuum. And even though this is a very good approach for ectasia risk assessment, what I believe we need to have a better uh, sensitivity and that will be going to the level of really customizing the data that the patient has. So the pathophysiology of ectasia, this is basic. We have biomechanical decompensation because the cornea was weak or because the cornea had an environment issue, which is related to laser vision correction and also eye rubbing. Any cornea may develop ectasia. So you can start with a 600 micron cornea, normal topography, normal endothelium, excellent biomechanics, but if you do a very thick flap or you do multiple enhancements or very high corrections, that cornea will eventually decompensate. Eventually, that cornea may be strong enough to allow for 200, 210 residual stromal bed. Other corneas may be unstable just blinking. The reason I'm trying to explain to you this is that we have to go beyond the understanding of shape so that we go to the biomechanical level. The Violet June is a public awareness campaign that we talk about keratoconus and eye rubbing. Eye rubbing is not new. My friend Alan Carlson from the United States, he published a very nice uh, review on eye rubbing and the role of eye rubbing for keratoconus. Very few things we have 100% of consensus. And this 100% of consensus that eye rubbing is related to the severity and to the progression of the disease. And controlling the patient not to rub the eye, including allergy and anti-inflammatory control is critical. This is a kid that put on, on the YouTube, the, the, I, this is the eye rub, that's the name of the video. And you see how happy he is when he's rubbing the eye. This is really something we have to teach patients not to do. Because if he has a susceptible cornea, then he will develop ectasia. Maybe that patient has a strong cornea and will not develop ectasia unless he keeps rubbing and breaks the biomechanical resistance of his cornea. So we need to address ectasia susceptibility. And addressing ectasia susceptibility goes to multimodality. And multimodality includes different clinical approaches from slit lamp biomicroscopy, scissoring on the retinal reflex and retinoscopy, corneal thickness in the center, topography with the placido, you have shine fluid tomography, you have wavefront data, you have a barometry data and quality of vision indices like the ocular scattering index from 
HD analyzer, you have biometry, the relationship between anterior chamber depth and axial length is important. We have segmental tomography with OCT and very high frequency ultrasound, a great work by Dan Weinstein on the epithelial thickness. We have segmental ability to see the Bauman's regularity. We have the ability to see the curvature of the Bauman surface when you remove the epithelium uh, virtually. And of course, we go into more advanced levels of understanding of biomechanics, which goes with IOP measurements with the ocular response analyzer and the Corvus SD. We have understanding of the cornea and the cellular level. We know that the keratoconus corneas, they have more apoptosis of the keratocytes in the stroma, so decreasing the number of cells or changing the, 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 the number of cells through the anterior stroma and posterior stroma, that's very important, but something that we have to take a very big work still to do, especially with confocal imaging, because it's very hard to count keratocytes, and in the future we go to a molecular biology level and genetics, which will open the door for what I say as a personalized medicine. And all this data is important to give the diagnosis, to give prognosis for the patient, to classify and stage the disease, to do the follow-up, to educate the patient, and of course to do the treatment, to customize the treatment from refraction up to surgical planning and evaluating the results including contact lens, all this data can be used. So we have to get the understanding on what is the data and how we can use it, for which purpose we can use it. I was fortunate to do my training with Steve Wilson back in Seattle in the early 2000s. And this is one of the first publications that we, we became. And I remember when we started this, this study, it was to look at the relevance of corneal topography and proper screening. And 1% of patients that come for refractive surgery, they had some forms of keratoconus. And eventually, more than half of this 1% would have a very normal, a very normal slit lamp and normal distance vision correction. So topography is sensitive to detect abnormality in those cases. So sensitivity is critical. And here we have the, the example. I would say this is a, the example. That's why I use this case so much. We have... In 2007, this patient presented with 2020 in the right eye and 2015 in the left eye. This patient has abnormal topography. So here we can say that topography is sensitive to detect abnormality in a patient with normal slit lamp and 2020. However, the fellow eye of this patient makes it to the point that it may be that topography is not enough to be sensitive for detecting any abnormality here or eventually this patient is really a unilateral case. However, only time will tell us what is going on. And eventually, if you go beyond topography, you may try to detect abnormalities here. And that's the model of most of the studies that we have <coughs> with central tomography. The case presentation of a patient that had normal topography, I saw one of the questions, do you see any case of normal topography evolving to ectasia? The answer is absolutely yes. We have 300 residual stromal bed, PTA of 36%. Patient has a thin flap. Patient was not so young and developed ectasia. Interestingly, you can, after knowing that the patient developed ectasia, you go with this little yellow here and you say, this is a patient that should not have LASIK because of this abnormality here. So I started a study that looked at the variability of subjective classifications. So I sent this, this was patient number six from 25 topographies and we sent the, the topographies to experts using first the 1.5 diopter scale and then we use the 0.5 diopter scale, which is normative. Here you see there is no numbers while here you have the absolute number. So this is absolute topography scale, the Kleiss scale, and this is the holiday scale, which is actually the ISIS, classic ISIS scale that in the Pentacam is called the holiday scale. So they were asked, the, the colleagues were asked to classify based on zero to four, including uh, all the classifications, no two, based on uh, Brad Randomus original work. And 
interestingly, patient number six had a mode. Mode is the number that will appear most here, is zero, with both of the scales. And with this uh, more sensitive scale, the mode was still zero, but the variation was from zero to four instead of zero to three. So it's important that if this patient was sent to a democratic evaluation, he would have surgery because the mode, the majority of people would say, yes, the patient has zero. So the enhanced ectasia goes beyond, not over, two things, detecting mild forms of ectasia. Of course, if you have ectasia before surgery, you will have ectasia worse after surgery. This is very important to be understood that that's not the only thing. But of course, it's very important to detect ectasia, but we need to go beyond detecting ectasia. And of course, going beyond detecting ectasia is going beyond understanding topography, which is a front surface of the cornea. We have to understand ectasia susceptibility, the predisposition of the cornea to undergo ectasia. And we have to understand nomenclature. A lot of people ask about what is the pentacam topography. Let me see the topography on the pentacam. I don't think it's wrong. I just believe that we are not being specific on that. When I say I want to see the front surface topometric maps from the pentacam, that will be more clear that I want to see the front surface curvature of the pentacam sample tomography or the Galilei or PMS5. But when you talk about tomography, you have three dimension understanding. And the three dimension understanding, you have a many parameters, many ideas, many metaphors to understand elevation. But a few years ago, about 10 years ago, actually a little more than 10 years ago, we started a project to make it more simple. And to make it more simple, include the elevation understanding from microbelling in which you have an exclusion zone to calculate the best reference using best fit sphere. And then you see the difference. And also you look at my approach with thickness profile. And then you have objective metrics. The objective metrics include the level of susceptibility. And this is, if you use the Pentacam Bell and Ambrosia display, which is in the bed D in the third version, and even in the Oculizer and the Pentacam, you have the same. These are the numbers you should remember. The uh, Art Max lower than 390 and Bed D lower than 1.3. However, I will go to these numbers and then you will see that ectasia susceptibility needs to go further beyond tomography as well. So we have cases that had ectasia-like appearance that had successful LASIK. This patient had LASIK in 2008, 12 years ago, and the patient is, according to the US surgeon, very good surgeon, one of the best cornea surgeons that I know, he says that this patient is well, no ectasia on the cornea. The patient developed cataract. Interestingly, tomography is normal in both eyes, preoperatively, based on a retrospective evaluation of the data that we have. So uh, these studies are based on the U12 files, which is the raw data from the Pentacam that we can analyze using all the software that we can further develop after that. So in 2008, there was no bed D developed at that time, but we can use that data, acquire data with the, with the U12 files and retrospectively calculate the bed Ds. So it's a demonstration of enhanced specificity. And in this series from Steve Sauhorn, who is a, a great refractive surgeon, has done many contributions for refractive surgery with over 300,000 refractive surgeries uh, collected over time, you see cases that develop uh, a stable outcome after LASIK with abnormal shape, abnormal tomography. You see abnormal tomography and this patient did not have ectasia. And a patient with a normal tomography was having uh, ectasia after LASIK. So you see maybe age is key here, but we have to go beyond the understanding of shape. And the, the basic quad map the refractive called map, which has curvature, elevation, and thickness, uh, 
we have a lot of information here, but there's a lot of hidden parameters that we have to be keen to analyze, but we don't have the time. And that's why I tell you, we need to go and expand beyond using artificial intelligence in a very good, uh, effective way. If you see here, there are cases with so-called FFKC that were not ectatic, and there are cases that had ectasia with a normal shape tomography. The key is expanding the understanding of form through skeratoconus. Form through skeratoconus is not a topometric criteria. It was defined by Mark Hemsler years, decades, 50 years or more to develop uh, the concept of form through skeratoconus before topography. So it's not a topometric criteria. Mild and the Vela Fellow I with patients with asymmetric or very asymmetric, probably are the best terminologies. One fact is there is no consensus. So I always, when you talk about ectasia, there are a lot of concepts, ideas, thinkings, opinions, and I want to rely on fact. Fact is there is no consensus on what is from through scared opponents. Now I humbly call my opinion. My opinion is that foam through skeratoconus is the patient with a high susceptibility for ectasia progression. So the patient does not have a clinical disease first and has high susceptibility for ectasia progression. The problem is that how you will define this in the very now momentum, this actual momentum. It's easy to do a retrospective evaluation of a patient that had data of the evolution. He was normal and now he has a clinical keratoconus or ectasia. Now we know it's a patient with ectasia susceptibility back there. Or we have to expand and look at other parameters and understand the similarities between this patient and abnormal shapes. So the conundrum, which goes to more than 20 years now, is very well addressed in this beautiful paper with 30,000 lazy cases reported by Croatia, Dr. Bohak, and interestingly, the ectasia cases, 10 cases out of 30,000, so it's a very low incidence, 0.3%. Uh, and these 10 cases, you see the criteria that we have beautifully described in the previous talk fail to detect most of the cases. You see half of the cases on a thin corner. PTA, percentage of tissue altered, is only two patients. 20% of cases with a PTA higher than 40%. And all of these cases were referred to have relatively normal topography. Irregular topography based on uh, evaluation was seen in a majority of, uh, actually a large number of cases that had stable outcomes. And you see zero here because she was keen to identify irregular topography as a parameter before surgery. So these patients, did not have surgery. So interestingly, we have to look at our data. So we have an enhanced ectasia study, which uh, has been taking for over 10 years now. And I invite all of you to participate. I have participated with many colleagues from Egypt and uh, we, we, we are on the time to really test our algorithm and I need your help. And I'll explain you how you can collaborate with me. So this study is based on cases of stable LASIK and cases that develop ectasia that I have the pentacam pre-op. So looking at age, looking at the PTA, and look at the residual stromal bed, you see that these parameters are not very good by themselves. You see there is no case of, of, of uh, that, that lower than 250 on this table. So if you say, 250 is the minimum residual stromal bed for stability. It doesn't mean that a case that has 200 microns residual stromal bed will not be stable. But in this series, it, it was a criteria. It was like a rule. It's like a dogma that people obey to have 250. So in all these 3,278 cases, the residual stromal bed was more than 250. Interestingly, all these cases that were lower than 250 in this series develop ectasia. But I can tell you that I have patients that my past father, who was a pioneer on refractive surgery, who did keratomyelitis in situ, he was 
taught by Dr. Ruiz from Colombia, Professor Bahakir from Colombia, and he had keratomyelitis, which is before LASIK, before the eczema laser. And I have patients that are stable with other problems, but not ectasia. And eventually, some of our patients are doing well with residual stromal beds that are as low as 185, 190 measure on the, on the OCT. So it's important that we say that this has to be considered with a very big and very careful uh, understanding on the interpretation. IS value is the most important parameter from topography. The Aaron Rabinovitz, you see that uh, only 22.9% have uh, of the case have a irregularity of 1.44 more, which is the, the criteria for, and this is interesting that some of the stable cases were also irregular. The bad D, which is the parameter that I described, to improve the sensitivity to about 60%, 59% here. And we improved the algorithm based on Dentacam Random Forest, which is a advanced artificial intelligence technique for improving the sensitivity <coughs> and the accuracy. You have a sensitivity going to 74.3%. So now when we consider the Dentacam Random Forest plus the impact from surgery, that's the work that we have done with the brain, which is the Brazilian Artificial Intelligence Group for cornea analysis. This is going to include age, flap, ablation, and the relational thickness alters, not percent only, because uh, you, you may agree that a percent would have the same percentage if you have 180 micron plus 10 microns of ablation, or if you have 100 microns and 100 microns of ablation. So the flap impacts more. Other things, the diameter of the flap, the, the shape of the flap, is it meniscus or not? But here, we are looking at flap thickness alone. And we can, from this data, combine with enhanced ectasia susceptibility score going to a higher sensitivity. If we have these cases that were not detected, considering the fellow eyes, we would have about 99%, 100% sensitivity, considering the cutoff value that you have. So it's going beyond. And even looking at that chart, you see that we have to go beyond. We need more data, and biomechanical data is key. We start biomechanic analysis with the ocular response analyzer uh, with the past Dave Luz, and it's a very good machine. It gives you a lot of information, but the integration of Pentacam and Corvus is key. And we, we are able to tell you that from the studies that we have done, Pentacam and ORA will be good, but we need to understand objectively. And objectively, we have a very nice display from Vinci Guerra screening report with the CBI that was the, the topic for the paper that Ricardo Vinci Guerra won the Troutman Award in 2017. And connecting the Pentacam and Corvus, which has been our goal, this is a review paper from 2011, in which we combine the data from Pentacam, Corvus, and ORA and I, uh, I'm putting together a website that all of these references will be there. So I hopefully, the, by the end of the quarantine, I will have this website and some uh, very nice uh, ebook for you to, to, to get this. But if you want, all the references are available. You can just send me an email and I can send you all the package of the PDFs of this. So this is the major thesis for Bernardo Lopez, who is a brilliant colleague that is now living in Liverpool doing more engineering work. He's a physician, he's a great surgeon, but he uh, decided to do a PhD thesis on artificial intelligence and I helped him. And uh, the need for objective parameters, <coughs> we have topometric and tomographic data from Pentacam. This is a paper from uh, Fernando Faria Correa from Portugal, in which you have cut off areas under the curve, sensitivities and specificities for each of these parameters. We also combine the tomographic parameters with the Corvus parameters, including the stiffness parameter from Cynthia Roberts. And we need to get population and disease. The no disease and the disease are critical here because we need to get patients with normal topography and the patients with normal topography based on objective criteria from patients with a clinical ectasia in the fellow eye, and we call this case is very asymmetric ectasia cases 
with normal topography, then we have the patients with no disease as a clinical normal patient. Uh, we look at accuracy, we do combinations with artificial intelligence, and long story short, the random forest, which is a, a way of doing many decision trees together so that you can get a decision uh, for each of these trees and each decision gets kind of a vote, and then you combine this vote in, into a parameter. And this parameter will be the random forest index. So the random forest index using the leave one out cross validation, which is a very robust way of doing internal validation in which you do a model for a, a population excluding one, and then you apply this model for that one. And then you repeat that for these parameters for every parameter. So the leave one out is very robust so that you can have a reliable uh, information so that you can expect to be true in a population that was not trained. So here we have the 480 normals compared to the patients with clinical ectasia, compared to the 94 cases with very asymmetric ectasia with normal topography. This is important to understand the cutoff optimized. The 0 0.79 separated perfectly here, but we need to go in a 0 0.29, 0 0.27, which is a, a threshold here, so that you can improve the sensitivity for detecting cases. Of course, losing some specificity. In my opinion, this is a surrogate. This is an epitomize of the biomechanical susceptibility. That's what we aim for. Of course, we need external validations and clinical implementations. We have done studies in many places. Uh, we have collaborated with Iran, with India, with Germany, Italy, Portugal, United States. And this is one of the papers from my colleague from India, from Chennai, Prema Padmadam, he, that she, she got a very nice sensitivity and specificity for the TBI, but they had challenging cases as well. And it's very important that you can learn from these cases eventually on the criteria. We talked about some superior stiffening and very nicely pointed that it can be related to other situations like trachoma, which is something we also have here in Brazil caused by Chlamydia trachomatis, which is an uh, inflammatory disease that you have a normal corneal shape. And eventually, these patients will have superior thickening and abnormal corneal shape. And if you train the, the, the patients to develop normal biomechanics, you see the biomechanics here is not very abnormal. You can say that this is likely to be abnormal, but maybe not ectasia. And of course, you have to keep your clinical judgment. We did external validation with our population and still see cases like that here. The normal topography cases with a low TBI and some of the normal cases with a high TBI. So those cases may be the false positives and the false negatives, but these are the cases that I want to detect before surgery. And eventually these are the cases that are truly eventually unilateral and we expand our idea on that. We have some colleagues from the United States, for example, the early work that had the Colon Award a couple of years ago at the SCRS by my friend, uh, Brazilian friend, George Haddad, who's doing the PhD thesis with me, with the work with the George Warning IV in Carolina, Russia. The idea of biomechanical susceptibility in both eyes is very interesting and controversial. This is an identical twin. Uh, the twin sisters, they have very similar topometric data on the shine flug and on the placido, you see the 1.5 CD twice absolute scale, very similar data, all the four eyes with abnormal TBI, and this twin sister admitted that she rubbed the eye, and here she said, I don't rub the eye, I never rub the eye. So, but she has abnormal tomographic biomechanical index, even though the corneal shape is normal in both eyes. We have this patient that presented with unilateral ectasia, eventually called unilateral cure conus by my colleague who sent the patient to me. And this is truly unilateral. Everything normal in the left eye. This patient had a great result with a corneal ring. Actually, those cases tend to have better results. That's why I tell you about prognosis. This is, a, this is not a very weak cornea. This is a cornea that was weakened by him rubbing the eye. And he admitted to rub the eye more the right eye than the left eye. The left eye is stable. The patient was sent to London 
for a follow-up because he moved due to his work and all the work that Dan Rainstein did at the London Vision Clinic, including the Pentacam, the orb scan, the Artemis with epithelial thickness, and the patient came back a few years later uh, and the TBI was still normal. So this is the TBI of the first presentation and also the TBI after a few years, uh, everything was stable. So this patient does not have keratoconus. The patient has unilateral ectasia. This is part of the consensus and I love Star Wars. So I, I quote the Master Yoda wisdom in which we have unilateral keratoconus as something that does not exist. Keratoconus is by definition bilateral, but ectasia can occur in any eye and it can be unilateral due to a mechanical process. This is a very important concept. Beautiful work on the systematic review by Luis Izquierdo and Maria Enriquez, his wife, and they, they did a very, very hard work to put together the, the almost 200 studies and selected uh, uh, 95 studies in which they try to see the definition of subclinical and thrust. Uh, it's hard to, to do this type of study, but the conclusion is that there is a lack of uh, criteria. There is no unified criteria. So we need to understand what is, uh, is being done in the literature. And if we don't talk, for example, if I was speaking Portuguese here, you would see my slides and you wouldn't understand anything. If you, you keep speaking Arabic, you may be giving me the, 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 the most wisdom that I cannot understand. So we have to speak the same language and understanding the nomenclature is very important. But the nomenclature means what we are trying to say. And we have to understand that eventually you're not using the proper words because the proper concepts are not there yet. So we are not looking for a subclinical keratoconus or fruit keratoconus, which is by definition uh, confused, literally. We are talking about susceptibility and susceptibility is defined in this paper. In the literature, you have this susceptibility in a patient that had LASIK only in the left eye the right eye was not operated. She would qualify for LASIK, but based on Pentakim and ORA, the base of this publication of 2010, I would say that she was susceptible. I remember receiving a comment, not a letter. I, I really wish that that letter was sent, that he would say that this is just noise that we are detecting on these machines and this patient would have done LASIK properly in the right eye. But interestingly, the patient is still stable. So just look at the right eye, please. Green topography, this is a fact. Minus six, minus one, 2015, this is correct vision. Thickness, 528. This looks like a good candidate for laser vision correction. Is a borderline pentacam, as it was when I published the work on the case report, borderline, borderline. Interestingly, when we do the tomography and biomechanical index, we have 0 0.78. And this is a susceptibility for detecting. She does not have keratoconus. The patient has ectasia susceptibility. Interestingly, the patient's son, with 11 years old, with 20-20, this is corrected with myopic astigmatism. The patient has abnormal TBI in both eyes. This is truly a fruit keratoconus. This is the kid that we have to advise not to rub the eye. That's the soul of a violet gene campaign. And interestingly, this is a situation that we have seen in other many cases that we are collecting for a publication soon. Interestingly, it's bilateral fruits, bilateral susceptibility. Understanding how we can get better. I do believe that we have gone through a very tough time. We are still going through this with the COVID-19 and it gives us the ability to think, the time to think and to expand. This table summarized the patients, the, the publications on the TBI. So we have seen publications with a very low sensitivity in patients with normal topography and normal tomography and normal biomechanics. 
So that, those are fellow eyes of patients with clinical ectasia in one eye, and the fellow eye has normal topography, front surface, tomography based on the bad D, and biomechanics based on the CDI. So these are really handpicking and highly selecting the tough cases. We collected those cases. We have to be proactive. We collected those cases and looked at the raw data. And then we have to, the ability to improve the algorithm to, to train it better. It's like you have a, a, a team. I love soccer. And I, I, I'm, I'm, I think you've been too, too much kind to me to compare myself with Pelé. Pelé has been the best of the best, which I'm honored. And I highly thank you for that. But we have to understand that if you, if you have a soccer team, like the Brazilian team from 1970 that won the, the third World Cup, very good team, great team. If they kept playing, another team will go and beat them. So they have to learn how to play to this new team so that they can get better. Of course, in soccer, it's not easy because it's the players get old and things, different things can happen. But here, we're talking about data. This is computer science. So the artificial intelligence, with the artificial intelligence, we can expand in not a true big data, but a bigger data, we can use the algorithm to improve it. So this is the dot plots of the TBI, and this is the dot plots of the new function that we have a random forest index based on the criteria. And we are learning how to interpret the low KC cases, ectasia cases, and we are eventually improving the algorithm so that we have decreased the level of cases like that. But we can expand the sensitivity uh, which was really decreased if you consider the new cases uh, from up to 90% to up to 80%. Now we're going back to 87, 88% with the new algorithm. So it's important that we understand that we go beyond. Uh, I have this final case to, to show you the importance of, this case summarizes the importance of all that I have said. This is a patient 26 years old with high myopia, she presented for laser vision correction. Normal topography, you see this is my scale, this is Ambrosio 2 scale. This is a little improvement that I did from Steve Kleist's concept in which I put the yellow uh, on, the, on, on, the, on, the, on, on the numbers that are more likely to be yellow and orange if they have higher case than 46. So the Pentacam D was not high, but it was kind of borderline, 1.27. But considering the patient normality and the, the interest and the eager for doing SMILE, because we do believe that SMILE is a better biomechanical impact as the lower biomechanical impact. But looking at this data, the art max would be something I would say not to go. And at that time, I really ignored that because of the understanding. We are talking about 2014. Uh, residual trauma bed was 250 based on the central cornea thickness. The patient did well in the beginning, and she was plano with 2020, a year after surgery, and a couple years after surgery, she was 2025 20, plus, with a little bit of abnormality here. The fellow eye was still stable, is still stable, and we had you address the fellow eye data on enhanced understanding of the shape. The patient looked at the posterior float of the cornea, this is the back surface of the cornea, the posterior elevation of best fit sphere using the same reference for the pre-op. You see early post-op and here, probably here, I failed. We have to admit, I failed to tell this patient not to rub the eye and to come back sooner. So she didn't come back from 2016 up to 2018. And in 2018, she had a much worse ectasia with a loss of the distance correct vision and uh, uncorrect vision 220, 100, and 2025 with high cylinder. So this case is truly ectasia in the right eye. What about the left eye? The left eye is not ectatic. Why do I say it's not ectatic? Based on the OCT. OCT data gives me epithelial thickness. This is segmental tomography. You see the donut shape in the right eye and the thick epithelium, which is normal epithelium after myopic laser vision correction. Of course, 
this patient has to be keen not to rub the eye and I have to follow the left eye very carefully. But this is something we have to do practice. We have to tell the patient the truth. I explain all of that to the patient. I explain all of that, including that in 2016, we should have followed her more careful. But she moved from Rio. She, didn't, uh, she, she, she did not come back for two years, for more than two years. And she understood and she kept the treatment with me. So we treat uh, the uh, allergy, tell her not to rub the eye. Vitamin B2 oral is important. And in the right eye, we did a femtosecond assisted intracorneal ring segment with the Visumax, the same laser that I did smile, of course, and uh, along with cross-linking. This, uh, this is the end of the surgery. I just want to go for, the, uh, for the, the combination. I just implant the ring, and then I inject riboflavin in the tunnel. And this gives me the epi-on cross-linking and enough probably to have this stability. And not only injecting in the tunnel, I wipe a little bit the epithelium so that we have a little more uh, uh, riboflavin in the center of the cornea. This is the, the result of the patient. She improved the uncorrect vision to 2040, now corrected to 2020 and she's much happier now. And the, the left eye is stable. So what did I learn? I learned that we have to be careful. Smile has a lower biomechanical impact, but it's not lower than PRK for sure. In the current scenario, probably I'll have offered surface ablation or fake IOL for this patient, especially based on the retrospective TBI. The TBI in 2014 did not exist, but I had the Pentacam and the Corvus so that the raw data, I can see the ectasia susceptibility in the right eye. So it's very important that we understand that the ectasia is a nightmare. The incidence is low. The advantages of understanding ectasia susceptibility with imaging is uh, unquestionable, but we have to understand the impact from surgery. And it all goes to the risk and the risk is going to be lowered if the patient does not rub the eye. And if we understand corneal imaging, the treatment of ectasia is a combination of corneal rings and cross-linking, surface ablation with customized minimal removing tissue surface ablation is also part of the algorithm for the treatment of ectasia. And this is a true evolution that is going through our revolution. And we have to think about doing the best for our patients. First, not to harm and do the best as possible, not to do a, a bad work for the patient. And if you don't know what to do, maybe not doing anything is the best thing to do. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking forward to good discussions in the next minutes. Okay. <clears throat> Sam, I will start uh, some comments with, uh, with, the, with the invited lectures and, uh, and I will keep the, the questions for you from the audience. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, both professors, Professor Magdi Khalaf and Professor Renato. I have uh, shared with uh, Dr. Renato several uh, courses in the ESKERS and the ESKERS. And uh, as usual, he is brilliant and he uh, addresses with very sincere and simple way. Uh, yes, sir. If you allow me, uh, uh, I know that you have been exhausted all day and we have exhausted you with a lot with this uh, fruitful uh, uh, presentation. First of all, I would like to pass the, um, uh, the saludos of uh, Professor Alio, Jorge Alio from Spain. He was just uh, with me now. Uh, comment, commentando something, uh, and uh, he uh, sends his uh, greetings for you, uh, Professor Jorge Alio from Alicante, Spain, and he says, this is very wonderful presentation, Dr. Uh, Renato. Unfortunately, he's on another webinar that yes, I had to all. comment on something, yes. And um, let me start the comments with you, uh, Dr. Renato. Um, myself, in my experience, I have seen from PRK, ectasia, just two cases. And the, it was not two cases, there are two eyes, actually. One number of years ago, and uh, I think that was 1994 or something, and then another case three years ago. And 
I do believe that ectasia with PRK is very, very rare, Dr. Renato, and as Dr. Magni have said, it probably has some cross-linking effect. What do you think about it? I agree. Uh, most of the ectasia cases that I see, they don't have any surgery. <laughs> this is a little <laughs> obvious and a really kind of, uh, yeah. but it's important to say, but you can have ectasia after PRK, you can have ectasia with no surgery. This is cure of the no So yes. there is a good paper from Malakase, Francois Malakase on a patient that was very young. It's published in ophthalmology. And the patient was very young and had PRK with a normal topography and developed ectasia. And if you see the pre-op topography, that the cornea is like a irregular cornea, and probably that patient was a mild keratoconus that would develop anyway. I, I, I uh, okay. If you see, so you don't, the, you don't. Uh, that's the second question connected with the first one. Yeah, you the, do, you do like to do cross-linking and PRK. No, 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 no. Never. The, those are two two animals. Um, maybe you have seen the cat and the lion. Uh, it's slide that I use. The 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 idea is that refractive surgery and surgery for keratoconus they may have everything in common but they are not the same. And if you think about one thing as the other, is like you, you see, oh, this is a little feline that I will pet like my cat. And this is truly a lion that will eat you up. It's like that. It's really like that. But going back to the first comment, I do believe that PRK has, may have an offer, offer some advantage in keratoconus. Uh, I don't promote that, but in some selected cases, I have done in stable PRK, uh, in stable keratoconus, I have done PRK. The problem is that if you do PRK in a patient that is, is still on the natural development of the keratoconus, then you have a progressive ectasia. Thanks. So the patient probably is rubbing the eye, probably he's young and probably he's on the natural mm. course of keratoconus anyway. So the PRK is just a little, a little push probably is not the push, but it's a little push to get worse. Uh, if you see yes. Tamayo's work, probably I highly respect uh, my colleague Gustavo from, from Colombia. He has the golden rules for surface ablation in keratoconus, for custom surface ablation. And if you have a patient that's stable, old, not, not so young, let's not say old, that's not so young, with a good thickness, with not very big irregularity, these patients are stable. And eventually, those are cure, clinical keratoconus cases. And he started doing that in patients that had P, uh, in, a, a PK, an indication for a, pe a penetrating keratoplasty, which in that time was the only thing to do. Uh, so, yeah. But if you consider the treatment for keratoconus as the same thing as a treatment for, for refractive surgery, you may get in big trouble. The, the yes. issue is... The, the goal is different. One is rehabilitation. The other one is freedom from, from needing from glasses and contact lenses. And the success in a patient with a keratoconus is, is good vision with glasses. is not freedom from It's not glasses. refractive surgery. Yes. It is eventually, but it's not a main The main goal. Surgery. It's not the main goal. Yeah. Not the main goal. Perfect. Okay. That's, the, that's the point. Okay. May I ask a question? For, uh, for, uh, please. Okay, please. Yes, yes uh, sir. By the way, uh, Dr. Renato, you believe in uh, LASIK extract? <laughs> I asked her the question it's, before. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, <clears throat> let's go to the fact. Let's go to the fact and the opinion. The fact is there is, a, there is more than one case of, of ectasia after LASIK extra. One is published in the JRS by uh, Sufio from Germany. And this, this case is presented very nicely. The patient had LASIK extra, even with low risk parameters. So LASIK extra does not guarantee that you are not gonna have ectasia. I remember well when Seiler came with the concept of LASIK extra, and he did a beautiful understanding and, and, and thinking that you would need a long follow-up of a huge population to prove that LASIK extra is giving you some safety increase. I told him you just need one case of ectasia after LASIK extra to say that this is not going to be 100% safe. So it's like uh, 
we, we travel <clears throat> a lot on plane and yeah. I hate to use that metaphor. And when you get into the plane, it's not 100% warranty that you'll be safe landing on the time that you will be there. It, it can happen a spectrum of problems. The plane can crash, you can get late, all the problems can happen. But usually you go to the website of the company and that is saying that 99% of the time this plane is on time. Yes. But uh, if it's, it's a measurement of risk okay. and, uh, and, and nothing is 100% safe. Yes. Okay. That's the concept. Yes, uh, let me proceed because we have a lot of questions and I don't want to make you late, Professor uh, uh, Ambrosio. Uh, the majority of cases of ectasia can happen in the first few years, one to three years, as you can uh, uh, imagine. But I have noticed something that with the thyroid patients, they develop ectasia very late and uh, I had a couple of cases after 14 thyroid hyper, hyperthyroidism. Okay. And both of them, they had ectasia after, one of them after 14 years. She developed mm -hmm. ectasia and it, it, it was coherent with the, with the disease of the hyperthyroidism. So do you believe that there is a very good congestion between, a good link between hyperthyroidism and ectasia do you think so? Yes, there is. There is. And there is a good publication on that. Uh, it's, it's not only hyper, it can be hypo. Uh, hypo, if you of see, course. If you see Hashimoto's thyroidism, it starts with a hyperthyroidism and then you have and then failure. Because, yes. And you have a failure of the gland. So yes. I do believe there is a, a big connection, which is something we have to be addressing because eventually we can learn a lot. We can learn okay. a lot. Uh, patients, some people have, they believe that patients who, besides rubbing their eyes, and this is very clear that rubbing of their eyes is a, is a very eminent risk factor. And do you think people who sleep face down, they do have a potential for more ectasia or this is just a coincidence? Absolutely. Uh, it's a very good question. It's a very, very good question. And Actually, it's it's something I I always say. It's rubbing the eye and sleep over over the eye. It's any pressure against the eye. It gives you biomechanical impact and also releases some some inflammatory cytokines. Not a, a acute inflammation with you know redness, you know inflammation yes. that's fully seen by the subclinical inflammation. It's subclinical. Yes. <coughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, moreover, I would like to clear, clarify something that you have said in the uh, um, a very clear message. I think it's a clear message that you have presented to us today, and I, I do believe the same thing, that formafrost is just an eligible patient for keratoclasia post -lasic. It's just a finding of eligibility. It's a patient, the, the word Formafrost as itself is an eligible patient, a candidate patient for a keratoctasia. Is it? Is, do, you, do you do you want to give us this message, Dr. Renato? Well, uh, Michael Bellin, for example, he hates foam frost. He says that foam frost is a very bad term, and I agree. Yes, I highly agree. But if you see frost, frost means incomplete. Incomplete. Yes that uh, Fruce disease is a disease that can be partial, incomplete, not full-blown disease uh, to the complete part. So it's a, it's, a, it's a disease that can evolve or not to the complete part of the disease. So it's, it's very important that we understand what Fruce is. There is no consensus on foam Fruce keratoforms. You see foam Fruce is, yes. there are many foam Fruce diseases that are described. Freud, Sigmund Freud, he described form through psychosis and neurosis. And oh, eventually yes. Is, Actually, yes. Yeah. Eventually <laughs> neurosis. Is, yeah. Form of, uh, yes. Frust neurosis. We, I remember yeah. this from undergraduate studies. Yes. So if, we if, have if, a if new technology. Yes. 
Uh -huh. to... go, go ahead, go ahead, new technology. Yes, go okay, on. because I'm sorry, Renato, because we have a lot of things to say and I, I want to, we, we want to squeeze you <coughs> a little, to get the, <laughs> the best of juice. We are, we are facing two kinds of new technologies in the market. And I would like to know your opinion because uh, there is a fight between two teams. Now you have mentioned football and then we are speaking about football somehow. And there is two big teams in the market now. One team is Argentina, which is the uh, uh, Pentacam Corvus combination and another team is as you will as you will be expecting by terminology the placido with oct which one will succeed which one will gain the match do you think uh, you know i remember a few years ago when uh, when neymar was playing in barcelona yes that we had neymar we had suarez from uruguay and we had messi from argentina so we, we made a, a joke that we should combine the, the countries so that we have just one country and the best team player because we have all the three. So I think yeah. that's, that's the answer for you. The, you want the to say? Multimodal, multimodal approach. Multimodal, okay. Uh, can I ask a question? Yes, please. <clears throat> yes, yes, sir, okay. Uh, Renato, th thank you for this uh, informative uh, lecture. Uh, it's very rich actually, and we got uh, very high benefit from it. And you are talking about the multi-modality of the diagnosis and you give a big list of the uh, available uh, options. But can you tell us what is your uh, routine, daily routine, if a patient is oh. coming to you asking for uh, refractive surgery? Uh, are you going to uh, <laughs> go through oh, all yeah. these machines? Yeah. Yeah. What's I can, your, I, your routine? I can, I, uh, I have a couple of, of technicians that help me, and I have a small practice, a small department. So, but my practice, I try to do the best as possible for my patient. And yeah. I, I always tell you thing, one thing, I'm doing the best I can. I'm yeah. not perfect, but I'm doing the best I can. That's one of the things. And if I, if I start saying I am the best, I am perfect, it's the first big step to fail, to, to be worse. So my work is... Uh, I do always a pentacam and corvus. And then after that, we do a, a, a barometer combined with placido. It's a very nice work. We have two instruments that do that now, one from Essilor and the other that's coming from my clinic, the other that's gonna be in one clinic. The other one is iProfiler, which is from Zeiss. Uh, I also use the eye trace when I see patients with vein dysfunction. And I have the Keratograph 5, for art for understanding the tear film and i do always the rt view which is the epithelial thickness so my comprehensive evaluation includes shine fluke tomography and shine fluke biomechanics uh wavefront a barometry sometimes with two sensors but for sure hartman check i do topography and but you see if, if i look at the topography from the placido which is pretty much the atlas placido it's limited because the indices that i have there are limited but i look at that i look at that but i i, I have I've been collecting many cases that this topography by itself makes more worse than good in my understanding of the case if you look at that topography, the inferior steepening is very common. And eventually in the case that I see the TBI high and the abnormality, the, the, the topography is not so abnormal. So, uh, and I use epithelial thickness since 2013 and I have a few papers on that. Uh, I do believe it's important. But uh, again, you, you can see that it's a very prolific examination. If you see myself as prolific, you go visit Dan Reinstein. Dan Reinstein has much more data to combine and I, I always tell him it's very hard for you to, to look at all the data. And, he, and of course, he has a very strategic and very effective way of looking at the patient's chart and making a decision. And that's what I try to do as well. But what you want is to have an index that will combine tomography, biomechanics, epithelial thickness, and wavefront. Okay, we, so it's to, to, tomography and biomechanics. That's the essential way of thinking, uh, Professor Renato. Yes, tomography and biomechanics are very important. 
we okay. we need to have we need to have that the TBI because that's the best algorithm that we have. But I look at the epithelial thickness as well. But the epithelial thickness is not part of the algorithm because it's been developed with a new machine. I use the RTView, which is a OCT from OptoView. It gives mm. me a six millimeters epithelial thickness, which in, which is great. It's very yeah. good. But I I need to have an ability to look at automatic detection of keratoconus, and that automatic detection has to be integrated with what I have so that I can put all together and the future will be to integrate. So if you if you ask me, you know, if you if you're asking me this in 2011, I would say I look at the Oculus response analyzer and I look at the Pentakim. But the dream, the, the the goal is to combine the data, but it was very hard hard to do that because both instruments were coming from different sources, different companies. And we had, we had a beta version of an integrated software that we never, we never put it successful because uh, when, we, the, the, when we were able to do that scientifically, we were not needing that because the Corvus came and started to give us more data than what we needed. So. Uh, even though you still use the ocular response analyzer, you can look at the hysteresis and the signal parameters uh, that will help you. The CRF and the signal parameters, the amplitude can, can be integrated with the, with the Pentacam. And that's something that we can revisit soon. Okay. Okay, so uh, I'll sir. pass the, the, the questions to Dr. Hossam and uh, I was uh, really astonished mm. that you have trachoma. So in Brazil, we, have, we are suffering here in Egypt from trachoma and we have a lot of uh, superior uh, steepness. Hossam, can you uh, yeah, yes, sir, but the questions to, yes, to yes, the professor? I, I think Brazil, uh, Brazil temperature or weather, weather uh, is almost like, like us here, especially in the... Mm. Uh, the summer, the hot weather. Um, am I right, Renato, about that? Yeah, please, uh, Jose, try to... Uh, Renato, Renato, do you hear me? Yeah. Re Renato, are you here? Are you, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Okay, okay. okay. Sam, can you, can you resume the questions yes. to Dr. Renato? Because he is exhausted. I can see we have exhausted him and uh, okay but he is he's a hard worker uh, sir don't worry about him he's still <laughs> he's still he's still having the sun he's uh, the sun is still there in present uh, we are but, right, I, but, but i will i will re resume about the questions from the participants and i will postpone or uh, cancel my own questions about the uh, you mentioned the aura and uh, you mentioned the corvus in uh, in the new module about the the corneal biomechanical studying in the TBI. So I, I, we have a question here about the aura and corvus. Which is better, in your opinion? Uh, you know, the, if you look at themselves alone, they are, they have difference, and the the corvus has been more studied for keratoconus today. Yes, but. The only one that connects to the pentacam for the TBI is the Corvus. So it, it or is not bad. It's a very good machine. It's an excellent tonometer. Yeah. For glaucoma, it probably will give you a huge import, important information. But today, uh, and I've been working with the ocular response analyzer for many years. Yeah, okay, but I actually still use it. But today I, I, I move completely. And of course, you have to take into consideration that I am a consultant for Oculus and I'm not a consultant anymore for Riker, but I have been. So I hate to say that, but if you see the advantages of Pentaca of Aura and Corvus, uh, the Corvus has a fixed uh, air puff, yes. while the Aura has a, 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 a air puff that would modulate according to the cornea. So I would say this is going to be something that you have to consider when you interpret the data. Uh, you have the data from the Corvus, which is a shine flug, and it's a cornea data. You see the cornea, and the other one, you just see the reflex of the cornea. The, the algorithm for interpretation on the artificial intelligence, you have much more parameters derived from the Corvus than from the ocular response analyzer. So, the ocular response analyzer is not a bad machine, but the Corvus is a more 
complex and more advanced machine. And that's, that's a, is a kind of a fact. Of course, you can use the Aqua Response Analyzer, but uh, I, I know I have some duty on that, but the, 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 the project for the Aqua Response Analyzer for Keratoconus module, they stopped. They just focus on glaucoma. And I think it was wise because, you know, every, we are passionate ophthalmologists that do cornea and refractive surgery, but we are a minority when considering all the colleagues <laughs> that we have that have to measure IOP in every patient. Okay. Okay, but, but anyway, if we don't have Corvus, we can add the, the parameters from the aura to the pentacam to get like the TPI in this, right? You, um, this is not something that you have automatic. Yeah. You can consider that. If you see my publication from 2011, the one that I, I referred to, it gives you the insights for, for understanding. If you have hysteresis lower than 8.8, .8, but this is neither sensitive nor specific as we can do with the TBI today. Yeah, okay. So the, the, I, I think... I, I, I call that, uh, that, let me rephrase your question. Some, some okay. colleagues asked me, oh, Renato, I don't have the, the Corvus. I only have a Pentacam or I only have the Oculizer. What can I do? I think it's, it's, it's really like the concept of the art of war, Shinsu. This is a very ancient uh, concept that we have to understand yourself and understand the enemy. If you know yourself and you know the enemy, you will win the battles. Eventually, not losing a battle is not going for that. You avoid it. So looking at the data that you have, you just keep more on the surface ablation and that will be a safer strategy. Uh, but if you ask me what is better, I am very careful to tell you which is better in terms of scientific accuracy. Scientific accuracy means studies in, involving good populations, ROC curves, area yes. under the curve, yeah. statistically significant. Yeah. So the, the, the Corvus is better than the, the aura, yes, based on the accuracy for detecting ectasia. This is black and white scientific data. Yeah. So I say, I have a more fancy machine and and you, 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 you pointed the, the, the OCT plus Placido, which is a very good MS-39. It's an excellent machine. Actually, I want to have that machine at my clinic, but it's not registered in Brazil. Yeah. But I would tell you, it's <clears throat> not an objective machine that gives me an index today that can be compared to the TBI or BED or whatever. But they have very good data. And that data can be used for this little lamp enhance the slit lamp analysis up to the planning epithelial removal with the axma laser. Or, so all this data can be combined. The, the beauty is to get the data together in an effective combination so that you can do the best from the technology to help the patient. Yeah, okay. Uh, from, from Dr. Mrs. Raman uh, from Mexico, he sent a question about the PAAI. Uh, he is asking you: Are you use, are you using the posterior asymmetric spheroidal index, uh, <coughs> which is which is bought by the DM? The, the rational for that, the rational for that. That's uh, I will I will share my screen. Um, okay. If I have this. So this is. By the way, Dr. Renato, we have a good treatment for presbyopia. I can see you wearing glasses for presbyopia. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Tell me what, what you can do for presbyopia. You know, uh, I, I I do a, uh, what you do for presbyopia. You are a uh, metrop or plus half a diopter or something like this. I am 2015 uncorrected for distance. And I have plus half minus a half. But... I, you know, it, it takes a whole, a whole talk about my eye. I have inferior stiffening and I am oh. probably, my eye is a probably my regular astigmatism, which is, which is not bad enough for me to be 2015 uncorrected. 
is the reason I studied keratoconus because when I was a resident, my professor told me I had keratoconus based on the placido topography. You are from a frost. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I'm not from, yeah. That's the debate. We can talk about what I have. I have inferior stiffening, but not from frost because maybe I have from frost. That's a debate. But yeah, are, you seeing debate. My, are you seeing my screen here? Yes. Yes, so uh, this, go this ahead. Is the, this is the braincornea.com. This, this is available for free on the internet. Braincornea.com. And you just log in and you do some, some registration, put your name, and then you receive an email. That's, I think, what the guys do it. But this is my colleague's work. So you have patient age, thinnest point, ablation depth, IHD, which is a topometric parameter, the bed D and flat thickness. So if you have a patient with a, you know, let's put a, a parameter of the bed D a little higher, 1.4 you see the risk will be higher. I don't know if it's going to work. It is going to work. Maybe, maybe the connection is not allowing there's some bug. So I have to log in again. Let's log in again. So I will get this patient. So you see the patient has 25 years old. If the patient now is 35 years old, the risk is going to decrease. So you look at the data and you can, and you can see the, the, the risk going down or going higher based on the data that you have. And you see lower risk, higher risk. It doesn't mean that patients with lower risk does not have ectasia. And it doesn't mean that patients with high risk will not have ectasia, will have ectasia. So it's a level of confidence for that. So if you have a patient with 20, 21 years old, and you can, you can decrease the risk uh, if you do a thin flap or increase the risk if you do a thicker flap. So this is all going to be related on the patient's characteristics. So this is objective. So hopefully, we have a smile here as well so that we can do a, a, a work. But here, we only had data from Corvis, from Pentacam and from Smile and PRK. So the, the wisdom that I try to tell you is if you have questions, don't do a cut. Just yes. do surface ablation or wait. Yes, your, your famous word. If you ask yourself about the case, please don't do. Don't do yeah. any refractive surgery for it. Uh, uh, so, sir, let's go for the second question from uh, Dr. Mahmoud Khalil about the, the case you have presented, or you have showed, you have shown in your presentation, uh, which was sus a case suspect, a suspected case, and you went for PRK. He he, uh, he is asking you, uh, are you are you doing PRK in such high error minus nine? And if you if, if you are doing that. Uh, what about the haze and about, what about the time of mitomycin application? It's for me, it's a, this question is for me? Yeah, for oh, you. Yes, I do PRK for high corrections and I use PRK, I use mitomycin in every case. Uh, the work my friend and colleague Marcelo Neto did in the early 2000s with Steve Wilson and he just was a fellow after me in, in Seattle and then he moved to Cleveland and he did a great work, many good publications, excellent work on understanding on biology of mitomycin C. Mitomycin C is safe and efficient. Uh, okay, is safe, but is the, the, the first question yeah. about the high error, Renato, about the high oh, yeah, error. Yeah, I do it. Are, I do you, it. you are going for up to minus nine or minus 10 diopters? Uh, I, I, I do any cornea, you know, everything. I, I go up to minus... 11, 12, depending on the asterisk of the cornea. I don't like to go more than eight on the cornea, but I can go up to 12. But it's not against the role of, of uh, the weakening of the cornea, the weakening of the cornea and the, the post-operative haze from the deeper ablation? Oh, the, the haze is, is a less than, than an issue if you use mitomycin C. Yeah. If you tell the patient to protect them to the sun, yes. and that's, that's more than an issue. Another question. So, this is uh, this is Giovanna and Rafaela. 
They are. They are. Yeah. <laughs> actually, they are. They are calling me. Actually, yeah, yeah. we have to. Yeah. Let's let's finish uh, uh, sharp on six o'clock our time, if this is okay for you. Which is after how many minutes? Yeah, let's get for the last last questions. Okay, about the post lasik ectasia, uh, did you did you have or did you see a case of post lasik ectasia which was hundred percent normal, no bit no no bit defect in in this case? Yes. This is the question. We we have ectasia after cases that we don't see anything based on topography, but any th query these points? Are the cases. In a, yes. Any query points in all factors about the bi biomechanics, about the topo, yeah. tomo, and everything? Yeah. Was you know, okay. most of the cases that we have ectasia, we don't have all the data. And if you see the publication from, from Bohak, from Croatia, you have 10 cases of ectasia out of 30,000. And if you see the list of cases that she can detect, anything is very low. So all the cases will be missed by general. That's why you have to go beyond. Yeah, okay. Uh, the question from Dr. Han about the LDF versus RF, which is the uh, LDF versus RF. You, you know the abbreviations? No, I don't know this. The, uh, the RF factor, RFS factor, which is the random frost. Random frost or the LDF, but she, she didn't uh, tell about the abbreviation. Oh, I, I don't know this. I don't know. Uh, we okay. use random forest with RF, yeah. PRFI, and this is Pentacam random forest. Yeah, random forest, yes, in the Pentacam. LDF may be another, another calculation, another device. LBF, oh, uh, RBF is a uh, radio basis function. It's a, it's, a good, it's a good way of doing artificial intelligence, but the, the random forest is much better. Yes. For our okay. work, RBF okay. is been is been R used by RBF. Uh, RBF. She wrote RBF. It L LDF. Okay. Maybe uh, maybe it's RBF. This is used by uh, for for the artificial <laughs> artificial intelligence for IOL calculation. This is the work, uh, very nice work, done by some groups who do IOL calculations. Okay, sir. Another question from uh, our junior staff, our colleagues about the redo LASIK, uh, the redo, in cases of redo, uh, do you prefer the PRK or the LASIK, even if you have a normal topography, tomography, and pachymetry? You know, enhancements, enhancements yeah. is an art, that's where you take good to great. You, you have to do enhancements, you have to take care of your patients that are not so happy, but you have to do it in a safer manner. Yes. Uh, when I do an enhancement, you have to think about two situations. One is a situation of a patient that are really undercorrected on a patient that could have had the surgery and everything is stable. The other patient is a patient that is regressing and you don't know if this regression is early ectasia or not. So this is pretty much where you have to look at the epithelial thickness, where you have to look at the biomechanical data. And, and we are starting a prospective study with the post LASIK, post LVC CBI. Uh, Ricardo Vinciguera did a very nice work to improve the CBI so that for the first time we have a CBI that is going to be specific also for post laser vision correction. Because if you look at the bad D, it's always abnormal because you have thinning. <clears throat> okay. So that's, that's something you need to have the data, especially epithelial thickness and you know, guys, we have to resume. That's the last question, please. Hello to Vanna. Hello to Vanna. This is Rafaela. Rafaela, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the second one. Yeah. They are the, almost the same. She's the youngest one, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> the, please. Her. The last please question. Her. Yeah, okay, the last, last question. question the last question for both of Dr. Magdi and Dr. Renato. Your preference? No, Papa! Okay, we will leave, we will let Baba to go. Uh, your preference in patients with mixed astigmatism with borderline corneal thickness and otherwise normal topography and tomography. What's your preference in such case with mixed astigmatism? Uh, those, uh, are, those are tough cases. You know, you have to look at the TBI and if you, if you have good, good structure for LASIK, it's the best. Femtosecond yeah. LASIK is the best. Yeah. But uh, I, I would say if you do surface ablation, those are the cases that you have to be very careful with the ocular surface optimization. 
So do treat this patient. I had a patient last year exactly with this situation with a thin cornea, uh, not unstable, but thin cornea, and I decided to do surface ablation, but he had a lot of dry eye. And actually he was contact lens intolerant, and the contact lens intolerance lead him to do seek for refractive surgery. You have to, to identify my Bowman gland dysfunction. And this patient was very much improved by IPL, which is intense pulse light to improve the, the ocular surface through the improvement of my Bowman glands and all oral supplementation with omega-3 tears with no preservatives or less toxic preservatives. All of this is important for this patient. But if you can do LASIK, it is better for them. Hyperopic uh, LASIK is better than hyperopic PRK. And mixed astigmatism LASIK is much better than PRK. But if you see the, the data from myopic astigmatism and myopia, uh, PRK can be as good as or even better than LASIK if you look at the long-term post-op. Okay, thank you, sir. Yeah, Dr. Magni? Yeah, yeah, I agree with Dr. Renato for uh, mixed, uh, mixed astigmatism and uh, hypropia. I would prefer fentolism. Uh, can, may I may, may, uh, may have another question for Dr. Renato and then? Uh, is it okay? Uh, just one recommended by one of the audience the residual stromal bed and the PTA. Are you using both? together or you prefer one uh, to the other? Well, um, I, I, I rely on residual stromal bed on 250 and actually I prefer to leave 300. Uh, I pretty much, I think the PTA has a good science behind it, but uh, if you see the last comments from Marconi, he, he says screening is different than identifying a risk factor. So a high PTA is a risk factor. Uh, PTA yeah. is not a screening parameter. So yeah. if you understand that, you have to look at the parameters with their relevance. Yeah. So I would say it's not a rule. I would say you can make a rule. Don't do the surgery if the IS value is higher than 1.5. Don't do surgery if the bad D is higher than 1, 1.45. Don't do surgery if the posterior elevation with the best fit torical ellipsoid, whatever. You can make rules on, on screen parameters, but not on risk factors. So uh, that's why I do believe that the PTA uh, and the residual stromal bed has to be taken into consideration carefully because you don't want to say no to a patient. And, and, and if you have a high PTA, it's because the patient has either a thin cornea or a high correction. So you have to understand if this cornea can be weakened. So the RTA, which is the concept that we are finalizing, is a relational thickness altered, which considers age and considers flap thickness and the ablation, along with the thinnest point. So look at the thinnest point, that's very much important. Thinnest point is better than the central corneal thickness. If someone, believes that they don't need a tomographer, I would say you need a tomographer because of the thinnest point. Only with a thickness map, you will have the ability to say the thinnest point. You don't need to have art. The Ambrosio relational thickness is a parameter that you have on the shine fluke from Pentacam or Oculizer. But the thinnest point, any tomography you can have from the first OBSCAN unit up to the last one. Uh, but okay. you have to look at all the data together. Don't, don't just sure. consider one, one okay. parameter. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Thank you, my dear friend, Professor Renato Ambrosio. Okay. Thank you very much. The, and the expert my pleasure to collaborate. In, so, Excellent. Okay. Last, last thing, let's, you know, please, uh, Hassan, co yeah. coordinate if anyone from Egypt has any case of Pentacam data with a pre-op Pentacam data. Yeah. that develop ectasia. Let's organize this data yep. so that okay. you can use the first publication for, for the okay. validation of the enhanced ectasia susceptibility score. That would be beautiful. Sure, I'm working I will, uh, on, working I will, on that. Yeah, yes, okay. we will, uh, we will uh, put this announcement, uh, Dr. Renato, in all our groups uh, to have a complete set of uh, pentacams pre- and post-operative 
complete set of pentacams, pre and post well documented cases to be sent to you if if we have a case of ectasia and it's clearly uh, documented and we once again thank you on behalf of the University of Al Azhar here in Cairo, Egypt. The, we thank uh, coronavirus that uh, <laughs> actually collected a lot of people from all over the world. Nice you won't category. imagine the, 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 the names that are joining the, the, the webinar in this moment and we thank you again and uh, hopefully uh, Everything goes all right for everybody. Thank you very much, yes. Renato, and uh, have a nice time. Okay. Shokran. Goodbye. Goodbye. Safe. Obrigado. Obrigado, Thank Renato. You. My pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Renato. Bye-bye, Renato. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye, Renato. Okay. Thank you very much. Shokran, Dr. Fasem, Dr. Hatem, Dr. Mohamed Ayyan, Dr. Ayyan Sarwat. Shokran. Ustaz Nakibir. Ustaz Nakibir Al-Ghali. Magdibay. Ustaz Nakibir. Ustaz Nakibir. Ustaz Nakibir. Ustaz Nakibir. Ustaz Nakibir. Ustaz Nakibir.